Hello everyone and welcome to episode 75 of Competitive Magic with the Carnies. I'm your host from Italy, Andrea Mengucci, and joining me we have Anthony Lee from Australia. Hola. Javier unfortunately cannot join us this week. We have an episode, this is going to be me and Anthony, kind of finishing off something of uh, the spoilers, which is now fully out of the Outlaws of Thunder Junction, whose pro-release will be this weekend. We're going to talk about the impact of the cards in uh, the um, modern Pioneer Legacy format. We're not going to talk about Standard because, of course, it is the PT format in a few weeks, so we'll be talking about everything Standard after the PT, but until then... Um, you know, we have, uh, we, we just uh, prefer to not do that. And at the end, uh, we're going to talk about maybe some deck building that can happen with uh, um, some of the new cards in Modern, because I have a tournament this, this uh, Sunday. It's going to be Modern. Uh, what about you, Anthony? Are you going to go to the to the pre-release? Um, yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll probably decide on the weekend. Uh, might, might be fun. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, the the pre release is always a nice opportunity to, uh, I guess, have a first hand on the cards. Actually, I'll be playing on Wednesday the um, streamer uh, event uh, on Arena, so I'll be streaming Arena again after a while. <laughs> I'm gonna be doing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of draft and I guess uh, comprehension reading of the new of the new cards to make sure that I don't you know, miss anything for <laughs> when the set that. comes on Magical <laughs> Line. Yeah, yeah, I definitely need. Uh, yeah, it's just just so many words on this card, and sometimes I just kind of give up. So I just play them, and then I realize uh, as, as things as they happen. Oh, some people learn by doing, not by reading. So totally exactly, legitimate. yeah, yeah. So um, something that happened in the set is that it's not just the two hundred seventy six cards that are going to be legal in standard and every other format, but also the set called Big Score, which is a bunch of uh, Mythic Rare. I don't actually know how much they show up in boosters, but you know, with the new uh, Play Booster, uh, you can open packs with uh, with multiple rares and Mythics. But they are uh, a, a bunch of cards that are pretty powerful, I would say. So it is going to be an additional way that they put cards into standard other than the regular set. So we'll have uh, cyborg cards like Rest in Peace, Pest Control, Grand Abolisher, you know, effects that are going to be super important, as well as uh, some really powerful cards like Memory Vassal and uh, just, you know, cards that you read, super powerful. They're not in the main set, but they're still in standard. So, yeah. Uh, th- what do you think about this set? What do you think I, about I the I think they're score? about one in five boosters, if that helps, by the way, um, that you mentioned. Okay. How, how rare oh, they wow. are. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I think so it's quite interesting. Co- quite, quite common, actually. Yeah, I mean, they do want you to be able to get the cards. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. A lot of these designs are quite uh, interesting as well, because uh, this came from a scrapped Aftermath set, um, or a, a, scrapped, uh, a scrapped set similar to March of the Machine Aftermath. Um, so I guess they picked the ones that were interesting and put them in uh, as as a bonus sheet in these packs, which is cool. I mean, that's the, it's a lot of content in the boosters <laughs> between the regular set, the bonus sheet, um, and then the big score cards as well. Uh, I don't know. I won't complain about more cards to look at. Seems interesting. Yeah. The so the fact that our mythic creator is not really. A- a thing because they come up one in each five regardless uh, they're all the same rarity i guess it, that's mostly for just arena wild cards uh topic oh sure i don't know like <laughs> I, I don't know what the what the reasoning would be either way but yeah the, really the, in terms of how the cards play of course. All right, so let's get into it. Let's talk about uh, the a bunch of these cards that, uh, you know, last week, if you've missed the episode 74, we talked about uh, most of the cards in the main set, whereas now we're going to mostly talk about the cards in the big score set. So let's start with Lost Jit. This is, uh, of course, a, a throwback to Umezawa's Jit. The picture is very similar. Uh, it's a legendary artifact equipment. It costs only one mana. And in formats with Urza Saga, that is a big deal because that means that you can get it for free. 
and it's an equipment and it says whenever a keep creature deals combat damage you put a charge counter on it just one not like the was yet when you put two uh, remove a charge counter you untap target land target creature cannot block this turn or you can put a plus one plus one on a keep creature and the keep cost is just one so it's a completely half the uh, Umezawa's Jit to cost one less to keep, one less to cast, and you only put one uh, counter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, a super interesting card, of course. You can think about decks like, once again, Hammer Time, just like we talked about last week with the uh, equipment that gives a plus one plus oh, haste and ward one. But is the power level there? For this card to be good in modern? I'm sure it isn't. I can't really imagine putting this card in my deck with Urza Saga. Um, it just seems incredibly slow. Like, <laughs> you have to deal combat damage multiple times with a creature to be able to have this have any effect. And even then, it doesn't seem particularly powerful. Um, the biggest thing that's a strike against this is that I don't think it adds anything that your deck doesn't otherwise do. So, for example, cards... I think we mentioned this last week as well when considering Lava Spur Boots, but, for example, cards like uh, Shadow Spear or Ginger Brute actually do add some kind of functionality to your deck that you otherwise don't have, right? Um, I don't really get what the Jitter does that you don't otherwise have. I mean, like, your creature can get bigger, but your deck already does that. Uh, it lets you get through blockers, but only after you've done that once already? Like... That doesn't seem very useful. Like, the untapped target land thing doesn't seem very useful in Urza Saga decks where the curve is generally very low. And again, you have to have invested quite a bit to get this. Like, like for this card to ever be worth a card, you have to have multiple triggers, right? But then I have to deal combat damage twice with it. It's mm, quite difficult, I think. I think the card is just not very... I th well, yeah, I think it's just not very powerful. I... I'm thinking about it in Pioneer now. It also seems very weak there. Uh, and if you just wanted to be able to get an equipment for whatever reason, like trigger uh, your Pure Steel Paladin or something, there's already Shadow Spear, which does, like I said, add something that you don't otherwise have, like the ability to gain a lot of life, uh, or to be able to preemptively get through blockers in a way that this doesn't, because you need to have already done so with this card. Mm. Yeah, I would be very surprised if this card yeah. was playable. Yeah. Yeah, this card definitely... Felt like a very, very safe um, way to... Because, of course, Umezawa's Jit was one of the strongest cards in Standard. It's currently banned in Modern, which, I mean, it doesn't say much. There's a lot of things that are banned in Modern. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is definitely something that people uh, wanted to hear. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I mean, also a lot agree of with you. Naturally, I don't think this card would... Naturally, it's natural to want to talk about the cards where there's a very clear intentional parallel. But something that I think is interesting about the way they design the cards is that when they make those intentional parallels, I'm sure that they are extra sa extra safe, extra careful, right? So, yeah. For example, with the Oko, uh, the 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 Oko Planeswalker, Oko the Ringleader, you know, the the minus one make an elk token is definitely a very safe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or like when they made um after the first Teferi was so miserable for people, they were very careful with the second one to make sure that it didn't upset people. So, you know, stuff like that but it still ended up <laughs> it still ended up costing 100 100 euro to somebody oh that wasn't the second one i was talking about you know um hero of dominaria into time raveler um but you know oh, so it doesn't, sorry, it doesn't work out that way every time, time. But most of the time i would say they try okay, to be more okay, careful okay. <laughs> all right let's get to another one where i actually think we'll see some modern play harvester of misery this is a three black black so a total of five mana it's a uh, it's a spirit with menace, and when it enters the battlefield, other creatures get minus two minus two until end of turn, and it has the basically the channel mechanic of you pay two, you discard this card from your hand, and target creature gets minus two minus two until end of turn, and it's a five four. Uh, where I think this card will see play, it's in uh, in in Living End. For example, in Living End, you are already uh, seeing play of cards like uh, Dismember and Bone Crusher Giant to deal with Doty Wood Walker. And I think this card fits the team better, as in you can just, you know, re fill your graveyard, reanimate it, get uh, the send eight and all the things. Of course, Living End is now nerfed with the ban of Violent Outburst, but it's still a deck. And I think Dotty Wood Walker remains, and, and Ragavan remain problems. And I, I like this card. I think it's also like not that hard to cast, and Living End very often gets to art cast their threat uh, post sideboard. Yeah, it's also quite relevantly a black card, which does matter in the Living End deck for helping you 
uh, evoke grief, I suppose. So I suppose it's better than, I suppose it's better than Bone Crusher Giant. Whether you want to play many Bone Crusher Giants or similar effects in Living End is uh, another question altogether. I think um, I am a little bit dubious of this card. It does seem like it's mostly only good against Stealthy Voidwalker, and the ability to to kill small creatures is not super valuable in Living End. I think like it is very exactly that you want to kill uh, Dalthy Voidwalker, right? Um, I think Ragavan sometimes matters, but not in every deck, and not always. Like, any time after turn 1 on the play, it's not too exciting, and it doesn't really help with uh, Ragavan on the uh, play, which, you know, it doesn't normally do anyway. I mean, which normally Living End can't do anyway. Um, so this doesn't really change that. I suppose it's an upgrade to Bone Crusher, but... Mm, I think only a small one, but it yeah. it is an upgrade. Oh, I just don't know if you want to play Bone Crusher a, in the first place. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a black card, and you know you could have played Shriek Maul already, but I guess Shriek Maul doesn't kill Dothy, so no, you, no, you no, wouldn't you could, have yeah. played Shriek Maul. Uh, but I feel like it's an effect that I don't think Living End has. Uh, as you said, it's unclear whether you want it or not. It's just cool that it's available, and you know we are discussing these new cards, and I think uh, it is one of the most playable one, definitely. All right, let's get to the next one. It is a memory vessel. This is a throwback to another car similar to the Lost Jit. Um, of course, we're talking about Memory Jar, which is a card that is currently banned in Legacy and uh, in the reserve list, so it hasn't been around uh, very much. Uh, you see, you see it basically only in Vintage Cube these days. It's an artifact, five mana. It costs two red, so three colorless and two red. And it says, tap, exile it. Each player exiles the top seven cards of their library until your next turn, players may play the exile card this way and they can't play cards from their hand, activate only as a sorcery. So, uh, what happens is that you're able to, of course, pass this, tap it, exile your hand, Sorry, uh, you can't play cards from your hand and you can only play cards from your top seven. But what happens and why is it very much worse than Memory Jar is that your opponents will also get to do the same on their turn. Whereas Memory Jar was basically just you draw seven because your opponent cannot do anything in their turn with the seven cards you give them. Um, also, Activate One as a Sorcery is another downside. So obviously this card has, uh, you know, they didn't just put Memory Jar into standard modern Pioneer and, and Legacy as well because again, it's memory jar is banned there, but uh, you know there's a, uh, it's still similar and there's Carnegie Creator and decks with a ton of mana uh, in Legacy. So I feel like uh, so Anthony uh, during a four season, uh, one of the most recent four season, um, there was a, a judge call because at some point a player uh, card minus and picked up memory jar, right, in, and and you know and the opponent was like. Are you sure that card is legal? Because I've never seen it in a while. I doubt it's legal. And uh, yeah, it turns out <laughs> it wasn't. So maybe that player now is going to be interested in putting Memory Vessel in their sideboard. <laughs> uh, I suppose so. Um, yeah, I don't know too much about this, to be fair. Um, I think I, I just don't know much about Legacy, so I'll take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, outside of outside of Legacy... Uh, the ways you can exploit this card, I guess, it's with, uh, you know, you got you got a ton of mana, and this is another of these, like, time, uh, time twister type of effect, whether you pay some amount of mana, you draw five, uh, sorry, you draw seven, uh, although I don't think there's too many formats where you can exploit a thing like this. No, that seems quite difficult. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not no, really sure. It's... Like, it does involve making a ton of mana, and I don't think... And, I mean, obviously, the main deck that would have a ton of mana and Khan in modern is uh, Tron, and that doesn't really use this Tron. Um, very yeah. well. So I'm not really sure where else it would fit. It does seem like a powerful card. I just don't know uh, where it would go. Hmm. One to keep in mind for future, yeah, so... maybe. Yeah, exactly, right? Because also the double red is obviously... It's, it's a big deal, and I think that maybe, again, it's something that Legacy can do with all the red ritual. It's a cool card, and I think uh, one that deck builder may wrap their head around. Yeah, I'm sure there's something you can do that's interesting it, with this. Like, it is a powerful effect. Yeah. 
Uh, let's get to the next one. Uh, we have a Molten Duplication. This is a sorcery for one and a red. Uh, so it costs two mana and it says create a token that's a copy of target artifact or a creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other type. It gains haste until end of turn and you sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So it's like a two mana clone until end of turn. And uh, well, it's only two mana. This is, this is cheap. This is not five mana. The potential is there for this card to be quote unquote broken. Hmm. What sorts of things could be used with this so i mean i know i know that you mentioned the that there's there's a combo with dual cast a mage which is the next tab yeah that's something there. that's yeah exactly that's okay. something that i found on the on twitter that it's a two card combo with dual caster mage but dual caster mage isn't modern legal right um yeah i'm trying to think what are the sorts of effects you could use with um uh molten duplication like are there ways you can cheat something and then copy it um maybe there's some sort of combo there uh, it being a sorcery makes it a little harder to do that, I suppose. Maybe, maybe you just have to have an yeah, expensive exactly. thing in play. It's a sorcery. I don't know. Like if it's like if you just have um, hmm, like just anything that's large, you know. Um, is that is there something with like a good enough ETB well, that that you could feasibly copy? And this next uh, this next tab open <laughs> that I was going to talk about next, uh, the Vault Born Tyrant. This is a great well, I mean, ATB and have great place, dice. <laughs> you're chilling, so yeah. That's no, but not. maybe like it has to die. It has to die, and this is a dice trigger. You know, something like. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to have to put like my awesome giant dinosaur in play before this card is good. Like, I'm trying to figure out if there's something like that's small worse. that that smaller, I should say, that's effective with this. Um, because this seems like it's maybe applicable as a fair card somehow but hmm like it seems like it has to be some sort of uh, hybrid function like it does something fair mostly but maybe then there's some sort of combo crackling thing. drake sure stuff like that yeah that's that's the kind of area that i'm pr that i'm trying to figure out whether you could play something like this you get uh, you get an attack i mean the problem with these cards is that they're kind of like this is what i like to call the a plus b cards and often this card is like dead on its own and you don't want to put too many A plus B cards in your deck. I mean, I guess it's fine if it's a combo like do a yeah. caster mage. Well, I'm trying to figure out if you could make this card like less like that because it's relatively open ended. Like, um, if you had a big combo with it, but if you could also copy something like a blood Tithe harvester or whatever, and you know, to cash it out, right? That that that's the most appealing thing when your combo pieces have uh, a secondary application. Then your deck is a lot more stable in general because it's harder to strand you with bad cards. Um, so I don't know what the combo application is with this card, but if there is one, it does seem like one where it's not too difficult to build in a way where you have some kind of secondary use for it, which I think is the most important thing. Like, I really have no idea about any specifics. I just am trying to think about um, this type of card in general, I suppose. You remember the card uh, Ratadabrik? I think it yeah. is something it has... similar to this. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a deck in Stander with Blood Tide Harvester. Oh, you're thinking of um, Jax like the Troublemaker, right? I remember that deck. You mean... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, uh, okay. Maybe, yeah, maybe this there's something like that. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe that. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, Again, like similarly to the Memory Jar, this card has power level, and it can. it's a very unique effect. Whereas, again, the Lost Jit... It's like, it's just an equipment. Yeah, like, it's not really about... Like, we're not trying to figure out exactly how good or bad a card is for the most part, but how much potential it has. And a lot of that is based on uh, uniqueness, right? Like, can this card do something that wasn't possible to do before? I think that's the most important thing in spoiler season. Because, you know, in not that much time, yeah, we'll, we'll find sure. out what the power level is. But in terms of what's possible, I think that's a lot more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like if you're listening to this podcast or this episode, you're you're not really looking to find the next, you know, broken modern deck 75 cards, but mostly you're just looking to kind of hear some of the cards that uh, may be interesting and uh, that may like spark maybe your uh, deck building uh, thoughts and ideas as well. So. I don't know. If you have a broken modern 75, I wouldn't mind hearing it. But <laughs> I don't have it. Oh, okay. I don't have it. Sorry. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go on. We have this giant dinosaur, which I pull out here because it has so much tech. So it's a 7 mana 6-6 six, six trample. It's double green, it costs. 
And it says, when it or another creature with power 4 or greater enters the battlefield, you gain 3 life and draw a card. And then when it dies, you make a copy of it. If it's not a token, so only once. But this is just so much text. And, you know, there's obviously ways you can cheat creatures into play. You have creativity, you have transmogrify, you have persist as well in modern. Of course, there's better targets like Archon of Cruelty or whatever else you can do. But this is like a very good A to B effect. Not as good as Archon of Cruelty, but in Pioneer, you don't have Archon of Cruelty. You have to put into play Atraxa, which has not to be proven so successful. I don't know if this is, but it it is a different idea. Well, it's a big thing that this stacks very well in multiples, right? Like if you put two into play at once, of creativity, they see each other and trigger each other. Oh wow! Right. So you gain you gain twelve and you draw four. Should be correct, right? I think it should work wow. that way. And if it does, then that's, okay. that seems quite appealing because I think a problem with uh, creativity decks in Pioneer currently is that they cap out. So like you can you can do X equals one to hit and attract it, but then X equals two doesn't add that much because it's obviously some limit to how useful drawing even more cards can be. Um, as upsetting as that may be to some blue players. And then you have some other targets, like for instance, for example, Torrential Gear Hulk, but that also caps out in terms of how powerful that is, because then your X equals 1 is not very exciting. You have some things like where you can go X equals 2 to be able to hit uh, Xenogos and Worldspine Worm, but then you have problems where X equals 1 is not really sufficient, and then you have some consistency issues where if you draw either one, it stops working. But if you just have something like this that's just like very generically good, that might that might bring something new to the Pioneer deck, right? Where, like, X equals 1 is powerful, yeah. but also X equals 2 is also, like, commensurately more powerful as well. So I think that's actually a, that's actually a and substantial this does, change. Go on. Yeah, and this one doesn't cost 11. It costs 7. Right, you could so just you play. can, if you play the, yeah, the Junk Transmogrify deck that won the RC in Japan, yeah. could pass this card, you know? I think this could be good in, uh, yeah, this actually looks like it could be good in uh, Pioneer creativity. I also don't, I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure this is worse than... I mean, it's probably worse than Archon because it doesn't interact with your opponent, but it wouldn't yeah, shock me if this was that's... playable a lot, like, in in that realm. Um, it is harder to interact with. Um, and it, uh, I think Archon has a, prob has a slight ring problem as well, which this doesn't have. Um... All right, no, yeah, I'm off it. This is not good Archon... enough. One. Yeah, it's, it's just not good enough to just randomly get some card advantage in one. I think, yeah. but Pioneer, no, I, I mean, think, yeah, there's something. Of course, yeah, something of here. course, it's not better than yeah. Archon, but I guess you you can't play more than four Archons, so oh, you can. You probably don't want to play more than play four. It. Yeah. All right, I've 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 made up my mind. I don't think it's good in modern, but I think this is quite a bit of potential in Pioneer, just because, or all, all of the existing uh, creativity hits, uh, have some scaling issues either on the lower end or the higher end, and this seems to maybe be a balance between those that didn't exist before. So, yeah, I kind of okay, like so, this one. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. One thing that this card is much better than Archon is if it dies, you make a copy. So if you put it into play with Through the Breach, or, again, this is not, uh, but, like, you have um, ways to kill this creature for, like, Flash, for example. Of course, this is a cube topic, but whatever. But like, Through the Breach is something that you put into play, you gain value, you attack, and then it dies... And you do it again, and you have something in play at the end. And of course, through the bridge costs five, blah, 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 but well, it's good. This, this is and not then, big enough for those, I think. It, that's why it has to be something like creativity where you care about the smaller version. Like, this this will never be the biggest thing you can do because you're not, you only, this only wins you the game if you're playing uh, some sort of fair game, yeah, right? You, you can just do a cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. So, like, you have to be playing against something relatively fair for this, for this to be crushing. But, you know, there's quite a lot of those decks in, uh, in Pioneer, so. Yeah. All right. Good dino. Okay. Okay. I got a card that Anthony approved. It. That that's not nothing. That's what not do you nothing. Mean? I like cards. Uh, <laughs> I just like different cards. To the right. cards you like. I like this card. There you go. That's two. Yeah. Pest pest control. Pest control. Very very strong in standard. Of course. Uh, it's a black and white sorcery. Destroy all non land permanent. We might have value one or less. And it has cycling too. So this card is uh, is is just one of the cheapest uh, sweeper I've seen in a while. And notably, it doesn't just kill creatures, it also kills. In Legacy, for example, Chalice of the Void is a huge problem. It kills, you know, Ether Vial, it kills Carpet of Flowers. It just does so much. I guess you can play it in Modern as well. It kills Amulet of Vigor, Hardened Scales. Mm, I don't know, Cigar is it. Like, it's just, it does so much. And it is cycling too. I think this card is going to be... 
is gonna see play in uh, in uh, older formats. Yeah, I mean, and newer. This, this right? seems like, very easy. I mean, we played Hidetsugu consumes all, and that was good. I mean, this is the important part of that for one less. I mean, I'm happy to give up the rest of the saga for in exchange for uh, the the hate card elements of this. Yeah, I don't know. There's not much to say about this. It's a very good answer, and there's a. Uh, uh, not much to say more, right? Like, if, if your opponent has non-land permanents with mana value one or less, this is good. And if they don't, this is not very <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah. The cycling is honestly a bit yeah, of flavor yeah, text. Yeah. Like, you're not really going to cycle it very often, I think. Because you... Like, well, you bring it in in matchups where, like, so, it's good, right? Like, you wouldn't make so that in, uh, in Okay, so in Pauper, uh, the card Suffocating Fumes, which gives minus one, minus one to your opponent creature, and a cycling two, gets played a lot in main deck. So I can see the same thing here, where, I don't know... A blue-white control deck with Leyline Binding, so you have access to black mana, can play this card main deck. Uh, Stuff like that. Yeah, maybe that's possible in Pioneer. I can't really imagine cycling in modern... Um, or playing a card that's relatively uh, narrow, happened. because I think playing narrow mm -hmm. cards is worse in modern because it's broader. Like, the format is broader and it's faster, right? Like, those are both yeah. issues yeah, yeah, yeah. for playing a card like this. Yeah. But, I don't know, I would play it even if it didn't have cycling, so, you know, fine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, well, if it didn't have cycling, it would be a 100% cyber card. But it giving cycling, I think you can consider putting in your main deck. That's that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, I, th I, th I think cycling is too slow to do that. Um, so I, I would basically treat it as only a sideboard card, but a good one. And I would be happy. I'm very happy yep. with the card that way. And, you know, maybe sometimes I will cycle it. Like, that's... You know, I mean, it's not like the card is worse because it has uh, a rare option on it, right? So why not? Yep. Okay, so let's uh, move away from the big score. We kind of... Uh, oh, no, actually, we have one more card that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, two more cards that I wanted to talk to you about. One is Simulacrum Synthesizer. That is the two and a blue artifact that says when it comes to play, you scry two, and whenever another artifact with mana value three or greater enters the battlefield under your control, you make a, a colorless construct that gets bigger for each artifact you have. So that's the Urza Saga construct. So basically, this is a 3-mana Scry 2, which isn't great. But then if you play Affinity with Artifact cards like Frogmite, Mirror Enforcer, or the Sojourner's Companion, or, you know, so on and so forth, you just get Construct. So this card can escalate super quickly. You can you can kind of go off in an Affinity deck in Modern. Okay, this actually seems powerful. I Obviously, there are big questions about whether an Affinity deck would be playable generally, but this seems like it would be very powerful in that deck. And that's... Like, that's quite a substantial power increase, right? Like, you can actually go way over the top of opponents that in a way you couldn't before, especially because this effect is quite good against removal, which I think uh, might have been a good way to fight some of the affinity, some of the good draws from Affinity. Um, yeah. yeah. The problem of this card is Brothers Who End and Dress Down, because, Not of sure, course, yeah. Brothers Who End also kills this and Dress Down kills all your construct. Uh, and that has been kind of one of the very easy way to deal with Affinity. And when when Nurse Saga came out, Affinity was a player in Modern and hasn't seen a player in in a while. But of course, Modern Horizons Three is near the corner. And you never know how much they want to push the archetype. Um, so I think this card has a you know a lot of a, a lot of potential in formats with free cards with free artifacts that cost three or more. And you know, Modern is definitely one of those. And legacy. Yeah, this definitely has a power level to be very interesting. I think I would definitely keep an eye on this card. And the next one also is uh, Artifact um, Synergy. It's called Fomor Revolt. And it's a land that says tap at the colorless. So it comes into play on tap and gives you colorless. And then it says tap three, tap, discard a card, look at the top X of your library, where X is the number of artifacts you control. You put one of those into your hand and the rest on the bottom in a random order. So in the mention, aforementioned deck Affinity, you just late game, Affinity always goes <laughs> empty-handed super quickly, and if your opponent, you know, killed your creature, you might find yourself just with nothing. You can just draw your card for turn, you discard it, you, you have all of, you all, all have uh, artifact lands and sprinkly drum, you get your thought monitor, your rebuild, or your thought cast, and you rebuild, and... You know, this is just a land that comes completely untapped, so it's pretty free and it's quite good in that deck. Mm. It does seem incredibly slow, which is not really in the interest of the deck. I feel like if the game gets to that stage 
you have probably lost the game anyway. Like, maybe you could play one, but I don't know if it's free. Because, I mean, I think there is a significant opportunity cost in terms of the other lands you could play, right? Like, if you have to play... Of course, of course. Yeah, um... Maybe. It's not an artifact, so yeah. you can play artifact lands. Yeah, I, I maybe you could play like one or something, but I, I, I think it's just uh, probably way too slow for modern. I wonder if you could play it in there. There is there is an artifact deck in Pioneer, um, like the blue red blue red artifact decks, for example. Is this playable? Oh, in the and soul artifact. You mean? Yeah, I don't know if being a colorless mm, land is pro- too painful there, but. The problem, it says, where X is the number of artifacts you control. Yeah, so like it many, might not be very many. How many artifacts? Yeah. Yeah. The fact that the... The, 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 mana, mana, the mana is worse. Yeah, okay, so it's probably yeah. not going to fit in that deck. In, in, in modern, you have artifact lands in the form of the, the bridges right. from Modern Horizons 2. And in Pioneer, your mana is already a bit taxed because you have to fit Dark Souls Citadel in your deck. Another colorless land is relatively very expensive because it's you know, the fifth one you've added to your deck. All right, so it's probably no good for Pioneer. For Modern, I think mm, there's a long shot at playing one, but I feel like uh, it might be a little too situational to justify the, playing even the, a colorless land. Yeah, the good thing of this is that, you know, as you said, you spend a lot of mana into it, like you spend three plus this, so you spend four mana, but you have affinity for artifact cards, so you get, like, let's say, a Mirror Forcer or Todd Monitor, you just cast it. You, you don't need to uh, tap many mana. Into it. Well, you do need to take mana for that's Thought why. Monitor, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just so <laughs> slow. You know, like is, what what matchups yeah, yeah, is no, this no, put again, in, in modern? Sorry. Yeah, I know. So there's not going to be a land that revolution its affinity. Like the simulacrum uh, synthesizer may actually become like a four of, and you know, the card that makes you win games. So, but this one is just something that again I wanted to mention as an option that people may have missed. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, we uh, finished with the uh, the big score, and I want to talk about a, a card that we missed last uh, um, last week that I think Macy play uh, in Pioneer. It's an uncommon, actually. It's Lively Dirge. It costs one and a black. It's one of those spree cards where you spend extra mana, you gain value. And this cost, it starts with one in a black, and then if you add one colorless, you search your library for a card, and you put it in your graveyard, then shuffle, so it's like an entomb for three mana. And then if you pay two more, you can return up to two creatures with total mana value of four from your graveyard to the battlefield. So what happens is you pay four, and you reanimate two creatures, similarly to what Return to the Ranks would do. Or if you pay five, you can actually grab one from your deck, put it in the graveyard, and then bring it back. Obviously, the deck I'm mentioning that can play this card is Amalia Combo, that already plays uh, up to four copies of Return to the Ranks. And this card is um, another way for you to get your Amalia and Wagger Walker into play out of nowhere. Hmm. I think there is a big problem in that it's very expensive to put any cards that are not cheap creatures in your Amalia deck, because it it has so much synergy driven by that. Is this card competitive with Turn to the Ranks? I think that's tricky. Uh, my guess is not, but maybe you could. Maybe it might be better than the fourth copy. Like it's very hard for me to imagine playing a fifth copy of that card because it's already a little bit awkward. You just forced to play Return to the Ranks because it's so powerful. But a lot of that is because of the convocability. Um. Hmm. It is worth thinking about. This is definitely not as clear cut as a lot of the questions in yeah, the so previous cards. The, I think the tiebreakers is how important is the fact that you can put one creature from your deck to your graveyard and then reanimate it. Like how often you ever turn to the ranks, but you are missing your combo. Well, yeah, very clearly because, because I mean this this card is obviously vastly worse at just doing the reanimate thing, right? Oh. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Hmm. So like, let's say you play against the. Um, my thought with Return to the Ranks is that when you play against decks that exile your stuff, like Anger of the Gods from Phoenix was a big deal, and why I wasn't a fan of Return to the Ranks. Of course, Blue White Control exiled your stuff very often. So, you know, that was... Or Ashiok, I guess. You can sure, also play that sure. against... Uh, but but this is not great at tutoring in any way, so never mind. Right. Um, but against, against non-Ashiok, against Anger of the Gods, this is better. Yeah, I could see that. So, hmm... 
Okay, that might be the best argument in terms of seeing one of these over a return to the ranks, or maybe even in addition to if it turns out that it's good enough um, for at at, at, uh, at letting you power through hate. Although, hmm, that's, that's I'm not very sure, but I think I could uh, see it. I could see it. Yeah, I think it's very close. You know, into I mean, obviously, I think once you actually play with it, then you'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly because you'll just know every single time. You, because if you don't kick it for the full five, then it's often going to be worse. But sometimes it'll be the same. Mm. Yeah, I could, it, I could see it being of being like a one-off or something that's very good. Yeah, so let's get now to our... I think this is the card that we're going to expect to see the most in... Uh, or like to have the biggest impact in Modern. And uh, probably in Pioneer as well. Um, it's Slick Shot Show Off. We talked about this card last episode. It's a 1 2 for 2, 1 in a red, flying haste. Whenever you cast a non creature spell, it gets plus 2 plus 0 oh until end of turn. And it has plot 1 in a red. And this is the card that, uh, you know, both me and Anthony thought that maybe we could try and build something with it uh, for this weekend. Again, I have, a, I have a tournament with the new cards and I want to maybe try. It's very cool to be like, I'm playing something that my po Like, this is something that I really enjoy when I go to a tournament with a deck and my opponent like, has to read my card uh, because <laughs> it's just so new that uh, that they don't even know what they do with despite they, they know every other card. And, you know, when I do that, when I read my opponent card, I feel like they made it, you know? I feel like they did something, uh, let's say, they accomplished something, you know, in deck building, which is always uh, one of the fun challenges of a, of a deck builder. Well, I mean, strictly speaking, that's, you know, as as a competitive player, I would think that many of us should, uh, I mean, if, if your goal is uh, just to maximize your win rate, you should probably not be trying to add uh, additional goals like this. Although I think it's totally valid to have these additional goals. I just want to make it clear that that sort of thing is uh, not, it's not part of winning more. You know, if you really just want to win more, oh. you shouldn't do that. But if you want to win more and also do this, that's fine. As long as you're, you know, doing it eyes wide open, you know, as long as you know what you're. Yeah, no, for, for. for sure. I, I do it very rarely because I still try to play the best deck every time or at least a competitive deck every time. So that's why I think the, the, the last two cases of it were with Questing Druid uh, when, you know, almost nobody knew what the card was in Modern when I was, when I was playing at that event. And also with Titan Blade uh, from the car, and like you can't mine as you get Titan Blade, it's it's another <laughs> right. Yeah, I think cool, honestly that's one cool of little. the best things in Magic when they legitimately are the same thing. Like when playing one of these strange cards is actually the best thing you can do. I think that's uh, that's one of the best moments in Magic. I think it's kind of the dream for a lot of players. And knowing that you, if you if you really sincerely do it, believing that it's the best thing, that's very rewarding. It does really feel like you made a discovery, which is yeah. Awesome. Yeah, like, like, like for example, at the Pro Tour round four, I sit down against the uh, Arne Ushenbeth and he went uh, soaring Vein Ripper, right? <laughs> against me. Yeah. And, and he went so, I went, he went soaring. And actually, I had to read soaring because that's not a card you play against often. And fun fact, he was an Italian. So huh. I had no problem reading. He's so thoughtful. And, uh, yeah. And, and then he played Vein Ripper, which I also had to read. Yeah. It's, it was, yeah, and then you won the game. <laughs> Makes sense. So, if you went soaring into Vein Ripper, yes. <laughs> yeah, and then Seth won the Pro Tour. So I feel like, you know, achieving something like that as a competitive player at any level, it's still like super... Well, you may also remember the example right? from uh, Minneapolis, right? Um, Light Up the Night was something that uh, you had to read as well, right? Um, yes, exactly. Exactly. I was at 14. I was at... A uh, ten life couldn't really lose, and then he thinks for like ten minutes. Not ten, <laughs> sorry. He thinks for like one minute, and I'm like, "What is he doing?" There's like he can't get out. You know, I had like a bankbuster flipped, another bankbuster, seven cards in end, and then he just went Chandra Light of the Night, and I died. And you know, it was <laughs> interesting. <laughs> yeah, that stuff is cool. Anyway, uh, as Link Shot Show Off uh, will not be. A brew for a while. It will definitely be a pillar of prowess decks. We can say uh, it is something very powerful because it's like double prowess. Because you don't only deal one extra damage; you deal two extra damage. So every 
every um, so one single lava dart basically deals six damage to your opponent. <laughs> That's insane. I think so. Yes, uh, <laughs> a lot of potential. Oh, here. Mutagenic growth, yeah, deals four damage. Uh, so you have all of these. Like today, I played a, a a prowess deck because I obviously wanted to get ready to see what was the best shell. And uh, the prowess list I played is the one that made. Uh, uh, they made a top eight of a of a modern challenge, and it was playing. It was it was the Gruul one with uh, questing druid, but mostly it was with Tarmogoyf. So lately, I've been a lover of Tarmogoyf in modern, uh, mostly from the Merktide uh, uh, point of view, because Merktide is very weak to pick your poison, which is the most played card in modern currently, and Tarmogoyf dodges that pretty pretty well. You know, it doesn't even. It doesn't even get hurt by graveyard eight. Like today, my opponent like Bushuka bogged me in terms of the next combat was a five six, uh, because obviously he cares about the opponent graveyard as well. So I really like Tarmogoyf right now. I guess there's like less fight out push with Rack the Scam. So there's just yeah, I f I feel like it's a good card, but I don't know. You can just simply replace a, a slick shot to show off in the slot of Tarmogoyf here. Uh, you could, but I think they're kind of different cards though. Um, with Slick Shot Show Off, I care a lot about pure card volume, which is why I think it's inherently more attached to blue, because I think Expressive Iteration is a really big part of why I would expect Slick Shot Show Off to be strong. It's not only that Expressive Iteration generates a lot of cards, but that when you plot, um, when you plot the Show Off, maybe that's more relevant than I had realized, because I remembered that me and Javier didn't think it would be a big deal, but the fact that when you plot it, um, you might be able to threaten your opponent with imminent death if they tap out um and that might not be an exaggeration given uh how much damage you can add up very quickly with cards like lava dart um it seems to me that then you want to be able to exploit them having to leave up mana right that doesn't that doesn't apply to solitude but for everything else they do have to have mana up to stop you from killing them with a show off for the most part so being able to then advance your position without exposing yourself to removal becomes very valuable, which this red-green deck doesn't really do that well. Like, it does have questing druid, um, so you can seek the beast. But I think having... I think Expressive Iteration is just the best card in that class, and of course having more cantrips in blue makes it easier as well. Like, if you have both... Like, here you have both uh, the seek the beast and Expressive Iteration to exploit that, and you plot the shaft and force them to start playing more passively. Um... So I think that's really important. Like, if you want to use the plot ability well, I'm not saying that you have to. It's possible that you do just play the card the way that we thought that you would last week and, you know, just jam it and kill your opponent quickly that way. Um, I think you want cards like Expressive Iteration. So I think it's both things. So ex Expressive Iteration means you have more cards, which means more kills, more damage with the show off, but also that it lets you use the plot ability better when you can force your opponent to play passively by uh, plotting it. Um... Yeah. Uh, also, another random point about plotting it, since you were talking about pick your poison, is that uh, pl uh, if if you have it hidden in exile, it can't it can't be poisoned. So that's nice. You just save it up and then kill them in one go with it. So that's actually a, that's actually an advantage that you have with plot, I suppose. If people are specifically using sorcery speed interaction like pick your poison, then the plot mechanic becomes quite a bit better. So that's interesting too, right? Yeah, also uh, spell peers, like you can have a counter spell Yeah, exactly, to yeah, you it. get to pick your fights a little better. Um... Yeah, so uh, w one question I have about uh, the plot mechanic. Can you, like, uh, Tishana Stide Binder, the fact that you're plotting this? And when you cast it, you're simply casting it's just it. A spell, so... yeah. Yeah, 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 Tishana Stide Binder, or effects like that don't. Like Teferi, you can cast it easily through a Teferi, and like yep, yep, yep. It's exactly the same as Fortel. Okay, okay, yeah. I just want to make sure how the the mechanic was uh, was worded. So yeah, it's basically Fortel, but uh, yeah. Okay, well, so uh, you know, if I had to build a stead deck for for a tournament this weekend, so an, another cool thing of this Regrin Prowess deck was um, a Tar Fire. Which actually came up so often that I was able to have a Dragon's Rage Channeler in Delirium because of Tar Fire, uh, like on turn two. So kind of fun. Uh, Tar Fire obviously is the uh, shock with the uh, super type of Tribal. So you pump the Tarmogoyf. I was able to have seven, eight Tarmogoyf. You know, uh, 
but mostly it was just very good with Anoli Heat and Dragon's Ray Channeler, and that's something I've never really done. So this is something uh-huh. uh, maybe back cooler that happened to me yeah. today. Back in the day, we used to use this to enable uh, Traversy Uvon Wald. So uh, yeah, Tarfire as a Delirium enabler has been around. That's that's uh, that's a bit of a flashback. Yeah, it's good memories. Yeah, I, I was also playing. Uh, questionable cards like Abundant Harvest and Crush Through. I'm not sure I would play those again, but uh, it was uh, it was uh, it, it was interesting. What do you say, what is your thought on Mutagenic Grow? Because none of these two lists that did well this weekend, the more regular Teamer Prowess or the um, Red Green Prowess, as I showed you, uh, played any copy of uh, Mutagenic Growth. What, what, what do you think? Uh, I don't think you really need it. Um, I think it makes sense when you're trying to be extremely fast in general. I think it makes sense, like it might make sense to play one of that card or maybe some even more of them if you're playing Slickshot Show Off because then you are more, you're try you're very explicitly trying to be explosive. I don't know if these decks are quite trying to do that because there is also a grindy element to at least the Teamer version. Maybe it makes sense in the red green one, but even then. Uh, part of that, the point of playing the red green one is that you're playing cards like Tamagoyf that are theoretically harder to interact with anyway. And if you're, so because that deck is trying to prioritize being difficult to interact with, then it makes less sense to try to make your card more explosive, to invest resources in making your card more explosive at the same time. Um, I mean, it makes sense to me that they don't play Mutagenic Growth currently. Uh, I don't know if it would make sense to, like, I think it might make sense to play it if you change the deck and have show off. Um, yeah, yeah, so. I, f- I felt like if I had to look at this list and have to ask the question, what do I cut for the show-off? I think the weakest creature in the deck is Oscar Mage. So I can see, you know, cutting this, but obviously you're cutting a one drop for a two drop, so yeah. it can never be so, so good. I would. So the question is maybe you're trimming a little bit on the card advantage plan of yeah. Iterations Questing Druid. I'm guessing the more expensive spells, although you don't want to cut too many of them for the same reason that I mentioned, that I think they actually get better when you're plotting Slicks or Show Off. So I'm guessing you would cut some number... I don't know what the combinations would be, but some number of Soulscar Mage, Unholy Heat, and Questing Druid, probably. Um, I'm not sure what the numbers What about Underworld Breach? I think that one adds a lot to your deck, breaches. just by, you know, like... But I think it actually changes how your deck works. Like, you have, like, a whole combo element just because you have this, like, one slot in your deck. I feel like that adds maybe too much to to cut. Maybe maybe it's possible that, that we want to get rid of it, but I think I think that first copy just lets you have a, a kind of combo kill in your deck that you otherwise don't have. Like maybe it's possible that Shoff also lets you do that, but I mean this is just a non-creature way of um, a- accessing those. So mm, it's possible. It's possible. I hadn't really yeah, considered I, that as much. I agree but I think with it could you. Be the case, yeah. I agree with you that you should have one under a breach. I wasn't playing it today in the red green deck, but I felt like it. One is definitely a card that could just win you a game out of nowhere and you have Questing Druid, in this deck you have Preordain Iteration, so you actually dig uh, towards that. What do, you, what do you think about a Survey Land in this deck? You're playing 28 1-drops, 9 2-drop, and nothing else. So, But to me that's the reason why I can't play a Survey Land, because the tap line is so much worse in this kind of deck, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... But still, you know, survey lands have proven to be great in any deck with fetch lands. So this deck has a lot of them. Uh, obviously, I had spots today. I mean, I was I was thinking about that a lot today when I was playing, and I had spots today when I was like, as as of naturally, if you play a league, you'll have a spot where you just fetch for a top sure. land and do nothing yeah. on turn whatever three or four. But like, is that? Would have g- gave me enough advantage than a top lander on turn one on a one lander because that can definitely keep a one lander. Like I did that today with you know the channeler bubbled or just in this case of blue you have preordain. So if that top land if if that land would have been a top, you know what I mean, right? Like what do you think is the weight of gaining versus losing? Well, it's very hard to conceptualize because it's so much easier to see. Like you just because like it's easier to identify the benefit from something that comes up very often. Um, and is a small benefit as opposed to one that is rarer but is an absolute disaster. Like, I mean, actually drawing a surveil land is, uh, I think, often going to be unacceptable. Um, I think it's very hard to weigh these things up, and I honestly don't think people would usually play enough games to be able to 
figure that out, right? I mean, <laughs> it's not like like it's just random. Like if you just play like twenty games or something, it is random how often each of those cases comes up, and even then, you're trying to wait how good or bad each of those cases is. So there's still some subjective element to it. Um, so it's kind of something you have to reason out. And uh, well, I'll be honest, I don't really know the answer yet, but my intuition is that if you're playing this many cheap spells and there is some degree of speed that matters, that it becomes irrelevant. The other thing about Surveil Lands in this deck is that so many of your cards are interchangeable, I think, for the most part. I mean, obviously you have some cards like Breach that are very distinct, but for the most part you just like, I don't know, you you have creatures and and and, and cards that synergize with them, right? Then They're not creatures. Like, most of your creatures are the same as each other, just as, as insofar as much that that can be true, and a lot of your spells are very similar as well. Like, I don't. I, th- I think a surveil line might make more sense if there was a uh, more pressing need for card selection, I would say. But. Yeah, I think that the Canopy Land actually serve a similar role, and you can already obviously play, play them. Uh, obviously, <laughs> you can't fetch for them, so it's much worse. Uh, but uh, I think if you want to add, like, a spells, spell lands lot. I think Fiery Islet is better in this deck. Uh, yeah, that's what I would guess. I'm not entirely sure because obviously I've not actually played this deck, much less yeah, the yeah, Lands, no, But obviously, you no, know, that would be my guess. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, a card I was impressed today in the red green deck was Blood Moon. Uh, actually, in the meta game, there's uh all the Leyline of the Guild Pack decks. Uh, Amulet Titan is obviously a very well played and good deck. All the Leyline Binding decks. So. Again, I am kind of like winking my eye at the red green deck, trying to think about maybe I just want to play this, you know, changing uh, <laughs> a lot of cards here. Again, I really, I really love Tarmogoyf lately. And uh, Slick Shot Show Off, of course, is another two drop, so you can't play too many of those. But this was, this was something I like today, uh, today doing with like. That, I definitely want to play a uh, four pick your poison. Okay. I I know that. <laughs> like this card, this card is so massive. Like you just, you know, in so many matches. Like today, I believe I cited in pick your poison and destructive revelry. Like almost every, almost every match. After. There's just so many uh, targets for those nowadays. Um, you know, between Lilline binding and and yeah. So uh, that is, or is a saga, of course. So. Uh, I'm kind of in uh, the prowess, uh, prowess theme, and I I want to do something with the Slicksha show off again, mostly because this is the one of the few cards that really sparked my eye. Like like I remember last episode we were talking about Mono Black with the um, Insatiable Avarice, that is the Painful Truth slash Vampiric Tutor uh, spree card, and. I also remember asking in the Carnage Discord what you guys thought about Harvester of Misery, Mono Black. But yeah, but then uh, but like ultimately, even if yeah, these are but... playable, and you know they might very well be, um, they're kind of marginal. You know, like I mentioned that maybe we put Harvester of Misery in Living End, but ultimately it's not super different to Bone Crusher Giant. I think it is probably a bit better, but it's mostly the same card. Whereas if you have a deck with slick shot show off it actually does something uh novel like it's really new right like you do stuff that you couldn't do before with it you get to play with a new mechanic that you haven't played before you know i think yeah i mean also this kind of literally has show off in the name <laughs> i only just thought about that but yeah i mean i get that yeah, this on turn... what were you saying yeah you can keep your opponent on turn three so easily with this card like i sure. can definitely see yeah. a scenario where you win on turn three with this card. I don't know. Winning on turn three sounds so exciting to me. <laughs> well, like you can you try. Know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I see this as more exciting like, as well. Yeah. Like today, I I won a match on, uh, on turn four, you know, and uh, through several interactions, and I wasn't even playing this card. So, it's definitely. Uh, it's definitely something, uh, something that I, I want to be doing and something that. I think will be just like I can also say that this is like an easy deck building. Like you don't need too much to build a prowess deck with this card, right? I don't know. I mean, because I think because I think this card in the same way that I think this card adds something to your deck, I think that also means that that changes that may have more implications than we realize. 
like how I mentioned that I thought that mutagenic growth didn't particularly make sense in the existing builds and agreed with them not playing it. Whereas I've become less sure of that if we are playing card text next shot show off. So I think, I mean, what I would say is that you probably can't go very wrong, but figuring out the best way to do it is probably a bit trickier than it might seem. But I don't really know how, which is yeah. the whole point. Like I like the thing the fact the very fact that this card adds something new means that I also don't expect to be able to figure everything out about it very quickly. If that makes sense. Okay, Anthony, do you have any other topic you wanna discuss with the listeners and me? Or are you, uh, are you good not to wrap in, it not up? in particular. Um oops, yeah, I'm very occupied lately, so uh, I was happy to let you yeah, take the so, lead. <laughs> yeah, we're both, uh, of course, uh, very busy with the uh, PT testing. Um, that's why we're not going to be recording in the next weeks. Uh, actually, e- Anthony, hmm? uh, what, what, why don't you say to the um, Oh, to right, the yeah, so we will, we will still have an episode be. next week um, that we'll record. We'll record one later this week. It'll be me, Avia, and uh, our teammate Isaac Bullwinkle, and we'll be talking about uh, a topic that a few people asked us about and I think would be very interesting, especially with the three of us, and we'll be talking about uh, how players can improve over time, you know? Like, a lot of the time, um, we talk about how to uh, prepare for a tournament that's coming up, right? Or that's a lot of our focus is on what's coming up. But thinking about how to make yourself better as a player is something that's really interesting and something that uh, we are very interested in. So I think that's what we're going to talk about Um when we record later this week and we'll put that episode out um we'll, we'll record quite late in the week because we've been very busy and uh leading up to that but we'll put that out next week for you so you still have content from the carnies uh while we're gone for that first week and then i think we probably won't return until after the pro tour um but the pro tour is not actually that far so we won't actually be gone very long so, because we have that uh that episode in and then we'll be back after that so i think we're only off, we're probably only off for a week then right mango is that right? Um, um, we're here next week, then we're not here the next week. I think. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah just just one week. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because we made yeah, a plan to fill in. Then yeah. we return, mm-hmm. and we discuss about how the PT went, as we always do. The so last PT we had uh, Avier coming ninth. The, the 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 previous event, the pro the worlds, you made this up four. Before that, Javier top hated. Two pities in a row, so I would say that we have uh, we have had some nice uh, post uh, analysis um, pro tour po- episodes so far. Yeah, you know, there's there's three of us. Hopefully, one of us does well enough to celebrate something, and if not, there'll be there'll be something to talk about. It's it's always a good experience anyway. Uh, you learn a lot, see a lot, do a lot. There'll be there'll be plenty to talk about post PT yeah. for sure. We 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 always barely yeah, fit in what course. we want to say, <laughs> or rather, we don't even fit all of it in, do we? It's it's very hard. So. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Um, of course, we have a a, a Patreon, patreon.com slash carnies, where you can join and talk to us about what, uh, just, you know, whatever goes up on your mind on Competitive Magic. I want to thank uh, Marvin Reina, who uh, was our last uh, subscriber uh, on, on, on the Patreon. So, you know, thank you for that. And, uh, and yeah, that's it, Anthony. I'm going to say... Goodbye to all of you uh, for a couple of weeks for me. Again, I'll be listening to uh, Anthony Javier and Isaac episode on the on the airplane for sure. I always look for. Oh, also, I wanted to uh, mention another uh, podcast uh, um, I just uh, was part on, and I think uh, uh, that is the one with Humans of Magic. I don't know, Anthony, if you've ever listened to Humans of Magic. Oh, this but Javier great. also no, had an awesome. interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Javier has a, an interview with him, uh, with James, and uh, I made a very, uh, you know, a, a, a nice episode, I think. I opened myself very much to James. He was, uh, it was nice. and He's a very good interviewer. To that one as well. <laughs> very, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Top stuff. Very, very. Okay. That's going to be it. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, have a great rest of the day. All right. Cheers.